with a colleague called Virginia Brown, who happens to be um, no relation except as a colleague, um, we developed an approach called neurobehavioral modeling, which is specifically uh, designed to give coaches a structure by which they can begin to understand what it is the person is saying in terms of the way that person's brain is working in order that in the context of the coaching relationship uh, the coach can facilitate the process of the brain relaxing into the state in which it will itself begin to create the changes that are necessary. What I as a coach cannot do is change another person. What I can do is create the conditions under which the other person can take charge of their own change, but we need to know what we are doing in order to create those conditions. And for me, understanding how the brain is working enormously eases that process. And so part of coaching from a brain perspective is to begin to help the person be so informed about the way their own brain works that they can delight in beginning to use it as the organ which they have more conscious control of than may have been the case in the past. I actually take the view that change and development in individuals is an extremely difficult process. By the time we've got successful individuals well into their 30s, into their 40s, late 40s, into their middle 50s, much the best bet for the brain is to go on being exactly the same. Got the person there, the assumption is it will get them there in the future. But we know, of course, in a rapidly changing world, in rapidly changing organisations, uh, people run up against the fact that what they've got may not do. But actually changing it is very scary and exciting. How we create the excitement and manage the scariness is part of the skill of knowing how the emotional processes really work in facilitating and inhibiting change. And that again comes out of the neurobehavioral modeling process. One of the things that neuroscience has made me do is, is reconsider some of Daniel Goleman's work, of course, who was the originator of the whole concept of emotional intelligence. I, I find that sometimes a very awkward concept, emotional intelligence, because in the way that it's now developed, it's got into being a quantitative process. Uh, when in fact emotions, though they do have quantity and strength attached to them, are in fact much more subtle than simply being able to measure how much. But you will know many organizations in which scales are used to see whether a person is or is not or how much of it they've got, this stuff called emotional intelligence. I find it helpful to shift those words into talking about intelligent emotions. Because the fact is that this extraordinary capacity we have to use our minds to think intelligently is a huge capacity, not something that we at any level want to get rid of, but we do want to inform it better by the way we understand that emotions underpin the way our intelligence and our decision-making system works. So one of the things I'm beginning to find helpful is the idea that intelligent emotions are a more useful concept operationally than emotional intelligence. Now that we're beginning to get a very much better fix on the person in organizations, one of the understandings that's coming from that is that the brain is the master controller of the energy system within the body. And the importance of that is that it is energy which creates profit. Curiously, in psychology textbooks, there is very little, ever, uh, very little reference to energy. But in fact, we are a physical system. And we now know that there is no behavior that isn't attached to neurochemistry in the brain, and that all behavior has as its precursor the organization of the brain in organizing its neurochemistry. So we're beginning to crack 
this extraordinary thing about what is the human being. In parallel, there is no significant work going on of which I know that is cracking the problem, but what is the organization? There's a huge amount of organizational theory, but there is no systematic work going on which would help us arrive at a shared common understanding of what is an organization. And one of the implications for me of the neurosciences is that we ought to begin to ask the question, what is the organization? Could we arrive at a point in time in which, in the way that human beings are the same the world over, though culturally they may appear different, in terms of their essential systems they are the same, how could, you, how could we arrive at a position in which we also understand the vital organs of the organization and we are agreed upon them? It's not just one consultancy says this or another consultancy says this or why don't you do it this way or that way? Why don't we have something underneath that in which we're getting a much higher level understanding of the key elements of an organization. So my other fascination of the applied neurosciences is that I think it will lead us into an understanding of finding out how does energy flow, not only within the person, but around the organization. Where does it get blocked? Why does it get blocked? How can it be released? How can it be directed towards the strategic goals of the organization in both an operational and a tactical manner? And so I think that's the next big field for neuroscience in its applied area to engage with.